All right, so welcome again for those that are joining us. I'm Melissa Basinger. I'm an instructional designer in the Academy for Teaching Excellence. Um, we'll also be hearing later from Stephanie Whalen, who is the chair of our academy, the faculty chair. And we have several other members of the academy on this session today um, and helping out in the chat room. You can ask questions by clicking on that purple arrow in the bottom right corner of your screen, clicking on the chat icon and asking questions there. Um, as you know, we are in um, kind of unprecedented times. We are moving all of our spring 2020 courses and summer 2020 courses online. And so to help in this effort, to help in all the great things that you are already doing with your students, the Academy wanted to provide this webinar series on transitioning to fully online instruction. And today is part one of the series. We're going to talk give an overview of kind of expectations and what going fully online means, and then dive a little more deeply into part one, which is laying out an online course and providing quality content to your students during this time. Um, you will be able to earn CEUs for attending this webinar. Um, if you go to harperacademy.net and look for the fully online um, instruction webinar series or use that address you see on the screen um, and we'll also provide a link to this page in the chat room every one of the webinar parts and as I said we're in part one has an accompanying accompanying personal action plan form that goes along with it and if you'd like to receive 0.2 CEUs for this session you can complete the personal action plan form it will get submitted to the Academy and then you will get um, continuing ed uh, credits for um, the time that you're you're putting into this uh, professional development today I will mention the CEUs again at the end of the session as well just to remind everyone and so as we said, this is part one of a five part series um, because it is just a lot to cover in one in one go. So today is laying out a course and quality content, but then every Tuesday and Thursday, um, you know, starting with this Thursday, we're going to be offering the additional parts. So um, next Tuesday will be part two, bringing course activities and assignments online. The next part will be providing feedback, working in the grade book. Uh, the part four will be building community, enhancing communications, and then part five will be supporting every student through uni universal design. So really encourage you to attend all five parts, um, either live or watch them as the recordings become available. So our agenda today, um, we're going to talk about I think what's very important and on everybody's minds is, all right, we're going fully online. What does that mean um, You know, for us here at Harper? And then in general, a lot of us are going into a fully online environment for the first time. What, what is that all about? Uh, and then um, Stephanie will join us and talk a little bit about compassionate pedagogy during this time. So that's really going to help guide our work and our thinking of how to bring <laughs> compassionately um, our learning experience into an online realm. We'll talk about some basic first steps that you can take in the next week to start getting this um, process up and running. And then we'll dive into the kind of the meat of our course, which is or of the webinar today, which is laying out your online course and providing quality content. And remember, this won't be everything. There's those other parts of this webinar series that will dig into assignments and additional pieces. So you'll be like, oh, you started adding content and then you stopped. <laughs> um, you know, that will continue, all those different parts will continue with the additional, the additional webinars. And then we'll conclude um, our time today. We're going till 1130. Um, we'll conclude our time with question and answer designated time. Um, but you can post questions in the chat room as the webinar is is proceeding. So I will not be in the chat room answering questions, but Janet Woods, our instructional technologist, will be there as well as other members of the academy. All right. So let's go into going fully online, what this means. So really since March 17th, we've been in a mode of flexible off-campus instruction. 
uh, which has served as a period to deliver basic instruction while we awaited next steps that the college community would have to take. So as we read in Dr. Proctor's announcement this past Monday, or maybe you saw in the town hall on Tuesday, um, Harper has made the decision to move all classes to a fully online format for the remainder of spring 2020 and for summer 2020. And this is for the safety and health of all of us, Harper students, faculty, and staff. So we do remain in this flexible off-campus instruction mode until Monday, April 13th, at which point all classes should have materials and structure in place to be considered fully online. Now, as we talk about what fully online means, some of you may find that the strategies you've been taking during this flexible off-campus instruction period really have already gotten you and your students to a point of being fully online. And you could largely continue to operate as you have been since March when we all had to leave the physical campus. Now, some of you may find as you listen to this webinar and the others that you do need to make some adjustments um, and continue to kind of ramp up things between now and April 13th to get you ready to be fully online, and that's totally okay. So that's what this webinar series is here to help with, and that's what this period of flexible off-campus instruction was provided for. So already you're taking a great step in the right direction by attending today. Um, while we will be focusing mostly on how to get your spring 2020 course fully online. All of these principles and approaches discussed today will also apply to getting a summer 2020 course prepared online if you find yourself in that position as well. So let's talk about what moving fully online means. So fully online means that your teaching, the students learning, and your communication with students is all still happening. But rather than happening from, say, 11 to 12, 15 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday in a classroom, um, it's happening asynchronously in a virtual environment. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't use technology to hold a synchronous live session every Tuesday and Thursday when your class would have taken place, but that's not expected of faculty or even necessarily recommended to be in a fully online environment. A true asynchronous, fully online learning experience means that each week or at some other regular interval, you provide your students content to review and assignments to complete electronically and on their own time. Students will work through those materials and assignments at their own pace at times that work for them throughout that week or that period of time. They'll then provide you with their work each week by given deadlines that you set, and you'll provide that feedback and encouragement that you would have in class. You'll just do it in the online environment. In this weekly pattern or regular interval pattern, everyone will move through the remaining weeks of the semester together, just without being able to physically you know, stand next to each other. <laughs> so a fully online course also means that students still need to connect with you and if possible with other students using electronic means such as email, online discussion boards, online announcements, or virtual conferencing tools like this Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that we're using today. Taking simple steps to connect with students regularly throughout the remaining weeks of the course will go a long way in creating a sense of community with your class. This sense of community is very important during this time. It can raise students' confidence. It'll give students a space to ask you and each other questions and really help, feel, help the students feel that they're not alone right now. So the third webinar in our series is going to focus specifically on ways to build community and interact with students in your online course to make these connections. We'll touch a little bit on things you can do even in the content side to make these connections, but we've got a whole webinar dedicated to this important aspect of being fully online, this communication piece. Third, moving your course to fully online for the spring 2020 semester means continuing to be flexible, both with your students and with your expectations for yourself and your course. While we're moving out of the flexible off-campus instruction period, that flexibility idea carries over into what can help you and your students succeed in a fully online mode. 
Throughout this webinar, we'll talk about being compassionate with yourself and students, talk about ideas for alternative assessments, and talk about things that you can do to help keep students taking that next step forward. And these types of flexibility and different ideas will surface throughout all of our um, webinar series, so you'll get lots of ideas. I'd like to talk a little bit about what fully online doesn't mean. So what fully online doesn't mean is that your class has to run or look a specific way. Well, we have templates and materials that we can provide to help make this transition easier. There's no expectation that you have to use certain pieces of technology or that you have to have certain things in a course to make it now fully online. So going back to the flexibility that we just talked about, you have the freedom to do what works for you and your students. Fully online also doesn't mean that you are expected to become an expert in advanced technology between now and the end of semester, and definitely not between now and April 13th. So we will be showing you primarily how to use Blackboard, which is our online course platform, because we feel that at least getting into Blackboard can greatly benefit you and your students and help you get through this. But we don't expect you to become an expert in it. We don't expect you to use every feature or any of the advanced tools. We don't expect you to learn 10 te different technologies or even one other technology on top of learning Blackboard. Fully online also doesn't mean that you have to give up on a meaningful learning experience over the next six weeks to end the semester and really five weeks of fully online. So trust me, you and your students and all of us are learning a lot <laughs> every day, even beyond the content in your discipline and just getting through the technology. We're learning a lot about what it means to persevere, what it means to step outside our comfort zone, really meaning a lot about what it means to be human. So you don't have to give up on this very teachable time for either your content or what it means to just um, persevere through this. So that topic actually leads us into our, our next area, uh, which is on compassionate pedagogy. And I think it will be helpful um, to take some time to think about this. So I believe, I don't know if we have Stephanie on the session here. I don't see her here. But if not, I will be happy to discuss her piece. Hey Melissa, hey, Melissa, I can take it as well. I'm here. Oh, hey, Mike. It, yeah, that's up to you. If, if, you're, if you're willing, Absolutely. that would be fair. And, and feel free to jump in, join um, at any point as well. OK, so then I'll turn. This is um, Mike Bates. He is our Dean of Teaching, Learning, and Distance Education. And he'll step in in Stephanie's stead and just talk a little bit about compassionate pedagogy during this time. Thanks, Mike. Sure thing, sure thing. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we wanted to start by talking a little bit before we got into the nuts and bolts of you know, building content in Blackboard about this idea of compassionate pedagogy. And no doubt, you know, you've, you've heard the messages from our provost and our president about really doing no harm to students, at least from a great perspective. And so you know, we're really recommending for folks to do the same from a pedagogical perspective as well. Uh, we want to start by sharing with you something that Brandon Bain, a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, shared with his students, which is an adjusted syllabus. And we think that's a great recommendation for, uh, for anybody who's making some changes, because the reality is in this transition, there are some things that just won't work uh, that you had planned in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, and I think his syllabus does a great job of just recognizing first, nobody signed up for this, not the online class, not the sickness, not the social distancing. Um, and that really we are gonna be human and humane in these circumstances. Um, and where we can't do the same things online, we are gonna pivot. But as instructors, like we're gonna be really transparent and clear with you about how we're changing. So yes, it's totally okay to change our grading schema for the course. Um, but we want to be really transparent with students about what assignments and expectations are changing. And even though we're online, that doesn't mean that we're not going to learn. This isn't just a rote exercise in finishing the semester. We are still uh, fostering intellectual nourishment, social connection, personal accommodations. And we will continue to remain flexible and adjust to the situation. So 
Uh, we love this this message. We love these principles. Uh, we think this is the right message and the students and Brandon Bain was nice enough to share this and make this open access. So feel free to share this um, or adapt it as you wish. Uh, just We just ask that you would attribute Brandon Bain if you do that. And this will be available as well uh, after the webinar. So again, Melissa, feel free here to jump in at, uh, at any time, but we just wanna again recommend with using compassionate pedagogy to keep communication open with students, ask them for their ideas, their feedback. Um, we want also for you as instructors, like not to feel pressure that this has to be perfect and it'll work perfectly every time. There's no doubt that you know, you've know you seen, you know, if you've looked at the, some of the same sources I have, you've seen some of the funny Zoom fails or live conferencing fails with instructors and with students. And you know we just don't want you to feel the pressure that you have to be perfect and things have to work perfectly off the bat. So I think one way to sort of approach that is to ask students for their ideas, their feedback. How is this working for you? How could this work better? Um, and really try to find ways, I know there's a lot of information here, but try to find ways as well to connect what's happening in your discipline to issues related to COVID. Um, and for, you know, for some areas that's a lot easier than others, but this is front of mind for everybody. So you know, we can't just ignore what's happening and go on as if, as if nothing has occurred. Um, and where you can, try to be creative. Look for alternate ways for your students to demonstrate learning. Uh, and as Melissa will share later, that also means in some cases using alternate methods for conducting assessments um, and maybe not using the same like high stakes final exams that you might have used um, in a non-campus class. Melissa, is there anything else you would want to add from, from this slide on compassionate pedagogy? No, I mean, I think you did a wonderful job. I really like the idea of um, one way we can build community, provide content, and connect with students is what you mentioned about connecting aspects of your discipline to the public health crisis that we're facing right now. Everyone's discipline, um, experts in their discipline, members of their discipline can play a part in addressing this crisis, can do things to help communicate, to provide healthcare, provide support, provide ideas, provide analysis. So I think that's a wonderful way to um, bring that teachable moment right now into the classroom um, and also show compassion for the students and for <laughs> the world and what we're facing right now. So I, I particularly like that, um, like that point. Thanks, Melissa. And one more thing I would share. Um, I know there's a lot of communications going around. And you will see, I believe later today, guidance from Maria Coons and the Provost Office on the flexible grading structure that Harper College and the Academic Standards Committee um, has adopted. So like the long and the short of this is that we're not giving any students an F this semester and that students can apply to have like a grade like a C or a D or even a B changed to an NP grade that will not affect their GPA. But while we don't want to get too much into the details of that because we'll see the exact wording and process come out very, very shortly from the provost office, we just want you to all be aware of that. So, you know, as you're as you're again doing your assessments and thinking about your grading strategy, the college is being flexible. And so in your work as you can, we want you to be flexible while still doing what you can to have this positive intellectual learning experience for students. Melissa, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some first steps that you can take um, in the immediate future to get yourself ready for fully online starting uh, April 13th. So your first step, if you haven't already done so, is reach out to your students. Uh, make sure that they are aware that your class and all Harper classes will remain in the online environment for the duration of the semester. If there will be noticeable changes for you and your students as you move between this flexible off-campus period into the fully online period that begins April 13th, 
make sure you acknowledge that and let them know where they can find course information starting April 13th. And we'll give you some ideas today and throughout these webinars on where you, <laughs> where you can be putting that information and sharing it. Um, make sure to let students know how you prefer to be reached during this period, whether that's via email or in a Blackboard discussion board or somewhere else. Just let them know how they can contact you, um, what you prefer, so that you can make those connections during this time. Next, sit down and take a look at your syllabus. Take a look at what's left between now and the rest of the semester. Start by looking at major assignments, tests, and projects to see what you're able to keep in full or in part. And think about that, um, Brant, oh shoot, I'm not going <laughs> to remember his name, so I've got to click back so I don't miss um, Brandon. Brandon Bain's syllabus where he says, um, you know, we cannot just do the same thing. Some assignments are no longer possible. Some expectations are no longer reasonable. You know, think about what makes sense for you and your students from an assignments standpoint. Then back up from that list of remaining assignments and projects and determine what lectures, activities, homework, other items you want to provide to students to support them in getting to those final assignments and being as successful as possible. So, you know, developing that list of assignments and supporting activities, take that and really lay out these last five weeks of the semester from April 13th until May 15th. <laughs> so look at my calendar there. Um, I like to think of it in two columns, kind of. What do you need to provide to the students each week to get them through each week? And then what do you want your students to provide back to you every week to work toward those remaining assignments and projects? So as you kind of work toward the answers to these questions, determine how you're going to provide that first column, the content you want to give students each week, and then the second column, how are you going to collect the items that you want the students to provide to you? So you may have already developed a system for this exchange during the off-campus flexible learning period, or you may be still trying to determine a method for this once we reach April 13th. Now, an example of a minimal way that you could set up this interaction between you and students is to send a weekly email summary to your students that provides a written lecture and written assignment instructions and a summary of what they should engage in during that week. At a minimum, you could ask students to email you those completed assignments, keeping subject lines standardized. You can easily see what's coming in and use folders to sort of file everything. So that's kind of a minimal level of virtual interaction. A preferred alternative to an email chain is to set up a space in Blackboard each week where students can find the content that you're providing to them and the assignment instructions you're providing, and then a place for them to return work to you and ask you questions during this process. So this preferred method of using our Blackboard system is what we're going to demonstrate today and the remainder of the webinars. However, in the end, the optimal way for you to interact with students and live in this fully online environment is going to be really whatever you find works best for you and your class and gets you through the students. We're going to be showing you one way and some ideas, but you'll need to take this and modify for works best for you. So to demonstrate this method, this preferred method of setting up content in Blackboard, I'm going to move away from PowerPoint slides and I'm going to be sharing my screen. Now this webinar will specifically focus on laying out your online course and the folders of templates we can provide you. And I'll be specifically talking about ways that you can provide content in Blackboard. But we've got all those additional webinars in this series that will continue to work on things like assignments, grading, and building community. So if you just give me one second, I'm going to stop sharing this PowerPoint and start sharing my computer screen, which is something that we can do in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. So the PowerPoint went away. And I'm going to share my full screen. Let me check. Yeah, there's that rabbit hole. <laughs> that just lets me know that it's sharing. All right. Um, 
So before I move into Blackboard to show you some ideas for layout and content, I really want to show you where you can get support and resources to help you when this webinar is over. Um, and you're at home saying, great, that webinar was fabulous, but <laughs> how do I start again? I've, it's time to, you know, uh, put the pedal to the metal or where the rubber meets the road or whatever the expression is. Um, so on harperacademy.net, your primary spot for help in moving um, to this fully online format is our planning for a rapid transition to online instruction page. And I'm going to click into there. A few th I'm going to point out a few key things that can really help you as you think about laying out your course and adding content. Uh, so first of all, there are these essential online skill sessions that we ran in person and online when the first announcements came out about transitioning to off-campus back in March. So this, if you click here, you'll get to a link. Well, I'll click here, I'll show you. <laughs> um, these are um, these are basic skills in Blackboard, starting from scratch, uh, taking you through steps like um, starting a Blackboard shell, uh, creating grading assignments, creating tests, things like that. So these recordings will take you through step-by-step -step instructions for working in Blackboard on these essential topics. The webinar series that we're doing right now will be reinforcing the skills that we showed, but we won't necessarily always go over them as in as much detail as we did during the essential online skill se sessions. So I encourage you to watch these recordings um, as an introduction or as a refresher for how to get started in Blackboard. So I'm back on this rapid online instruction page. Um, and I want to show you this resource right here, this off-campus flexible learning folder template in Blackboard. Um, I'll be working, this is a, a, a folder structure that we can actually copy into your Blackboard course for spring 2020 that you can use. And I'll actually be working and showing you that folder template today. Many of you may have already seen this or be using it. Um, but if you are, if you do not have it in your course and after seeing it today, you're interested in having it copied into your course, there is a link to um, a, if you click on learn more, there is a link to our online instruction support form where you can request the form. This is the same form that you can use for all academy support. So you can find that online instruction support form link all over the place uh, to click on. And this is where you can go to request this folder template. I'm going to pop into the form and show you where you can do that. Um, there's a, a place to talk about general support, but there is also a place here to say, would you like this folder template added to your course? And please give us a, a course number and section. Now we are also um, developing a summer 2020 full course shell that can be copied into summer courses. Now this goes beyond a folder structure and actually provides kind of a full course orientation and everything to use for summer. I will be showing a little bit of what the summer 2020 full course template looks like at the end of the webinar. If you would like a summer 2020 full course copied into your shell, you can also use this form and please note summer here. So we'll be updating this form to mention the summer specifically, but if you know today that you're gonna need it, you can still use this request form and just note summer. But for spring and what I'm gonna demonstrate today, we've got a basic folder structure um, to get you through the rest of the semester. Uh, lastly, before we dive into Blackboard for the remainder of our session, I do want to show you just a couple of these other excellent standing resources that we have provided for you. Um, so today we're specifically going to be talking about um, providing quality content to your students, so I do not want to go without mentioning the library services. So um, this is a fabulous resource to go to when you're trying to think about content to provide to your students that might need to be different than what you provided in the past. Uh, so each area has a library liaison that you can contact if you need assistance. And they even have a live chat feature that's staffed by Harper College librarians during the day and 24-7 by other librarians around the country. Um, for the non-Harper hours. So please make use of our library as you think about quality content. 
And the other thing I will point out is that um, there are great student support resources here as you're starting to build online. So including videos for how you can help your students start using Blackboard if they haven't been using it in your class up to this point. Um, and links for how students can get academic support through all of this. So as you and your students move to a fully online course um, environment, great resources to provide as well. There are lots of other things on this page, all um, short videos, how-to pages, so please make this page um, your friend, <laughs> bookmark it, and come and use it, use it often. All right, so I will move away from this and let's go into Blackboard. Um, so we're going to start diving into um, laying out a quality structure for your students for the rest of the spring and providing some quality course content. So as mentioned, we have a um, learning module spring 2020 folder that if requested through that form, you can um, have placed into your course. And inside this folder, we have laid out what we recommend as a quality navigation structure for your students, a student-friendly navigation structure. And what that essentially means is let's divide things up by clearly defined dates, chunks of time where you provide content, they provide that um, assignments back to you. Uh, and every week is clearly labeled with dates. So um, up to this point, we've been working in these off-campus flexible learning folders. So if you've had this folder structure up till this point, you might have been populating things into this folder. Even if you're not using our folder that we've copied into, we encourage you to provide clear folders with dates to faculty or to, to students. Um, Starting April 13th, if you have this folder structure already in your, in your course or if you request to have it um, placed in there now, we have built out in the necessity that what has, hap what has happened indeed um, was, took place, we've got a folder for each week going forward. So this provides a clear label of the dates for each week it provides an overview here of what you're going to be working on each week. And then inside, it provides a place for you to give a roadmap to students for the week. And here's kind of those two columns we were talking about. It's a place for you to provide activities and assignments to students, such as assigned reading, your lectures, things like that, or I should say activities and um, lectures and content to students. And then there's a folder for that sort of second column. What do you want the students to then turn back to you, the assignments for each week? So we provide prompts for, have them maybe do a discussion, have them complete assignments, or you're gonna have them take a short quiz or test during the week. So this folder structure sets up that sort of um, content that you provide to the students and assignments returning to you. So we are going to, with the rest of our time today, before we answer questions, we are actually going to go into this April 13th, April 19th folder. I made a, a second one for me to demo in. And I'm going to demonstrate actually building out a folder of content for the week, so for the, for the first week. And your goal is to try to get one week of content and assignments ready by April by April 13th. You don't necessarily have to have everything for the rest of your course built out by that time, but just make a goal of getting one week set up. And so I'm gonna show you the content side of things today. So the first thing you will want to do is to provide an overview here for the students of what they're gonna be doing this first week of April 13th through 19th. And you can provide, providing students in a fully online environment, instruct clear instructions, clear context, and a clear roadmap for what is happening that week, it becomes so important in the online environment. You don't have that physical touch point every week of saying, 
this is what I'm thinking about the this content, this is what I'd like you to do, these are my expectations. You don't have that face-to-face -face time to explain those things. So that becomes these that becomes content you want to provide in text format or in audio format or in some way to the students every week in an online in a in your online folders. So I like to provide context to students in a couple of ways. First, in the folder itself, I like to provide what are the objectives for the week. And you'll be able to edit these folders. Everything in Blackboard has a little button um, with an brings it into edit mode. So you can go through and provide um, objectives or an overview of what the students can expect that week. So I am going to make a model folder um, that for our week of content, and our content is going to be about tempering chocolate this week. So we are going to, oh, one second. There we go. Sorry, I was moving something on my other screen. So we are going to identify characteristics of tempered chocolate. We are going to defend the use of tempered chocolate over melting chocolate. And we are going to perform the tempering process. Note that I can edit right here inside the folder. I can expand this window if I need to provide, if I need some additional view while I edit things. And then I can submit. So now I've provided an overview of what students can expect during this week. Inside the folder itself, another great way to provide an overview to students is to use this module overview template space that we've provided. For each week, you can reiterate, these are our outcomes. This is what I want to accomplish from a learning perspective this week. These are the activities that I want you to engage in, and those can be provided in this first folder. And these are the assignments I want you to return back to me. This is when they're due, and they are all provided in this assignments folder. So you can edit this area by clicking on edit mode and going in here. I'm not going to edit this right now, but I'll show you a completed version um, at the end. So providing this overview and roadmap is so important in an online environment. Today, we are really going to focus on this model act module activities folder, the content part. Our webinar on Tuesday will dive into the assignments part and keep building out this model. But today, we're going to look at this module activities area and talk about ways to provide content to your students. So we've got a couple of prompts in here for providing content to students. At minimum, what this really means is provide your students some assigned reading and or viewing for the week. Provide them with resources that they can digest and go through throughout the week ahead. And then provide some context around that material. Ideally, you won't just put a reading or a video out and say, all right, watch this. You will say, why am I choosing this article or this video? How does this tie into what we've been learning so far? What would I like you to think about as you view or watch this? And how will this help you prepare for the assignments this week? Now, these are all things you likely might have spoken to the students or showed them in class, but in substitution for being with them in class and talking them through the different readings and content, we want to make sure we provide that in a text form or in some form for the students to understand what we want them to get out of the materials we're providing each week. So one thing I like to do is to provide a module overview for each week. They're going to go into this module activities folder and say, all right, what are, you know, what are we doing this week? So to add a basic item in Blackboard to add a module overview, I'm going to click on this build content and I'm going to add an item. This is the basic Blackboard content piece that provides 
a place to give text, videos, links, anything that you want to provide to students. For now, I'm simply going to provide a module overview. I'll number it one, and I can see when I typed before. So I'm going to call this my module overview, our week of chocolate. Now here in this space, you can type to the students, you can provide links, videos, I'll be showing you how to do that. For this, for the module overview, I just want to provide I just want to provide a few paragraphs of text that it asks the students, have you ever tried to melt chocolate at home? Did it work out? Why not? Below you find a few activities to help us dive into this topic. When you're done with these activities, you can move on to the assignments. So I'm getting the students set up for this is what I'm going to provide you, this is why it's important, and this is what you're going to be using it with. Now as you work in Blackboard, notice I had this typed up in a Word document and I pasted it in here. That can create some formatting difficulties for students. Just a great Blackboard tip to make things clean and accessible for all students. This little remove formatting button is great if you're going to be doing some copying and pasting. Notice that kind of cleaned up any of the weird sort of gray marks, it will clear the gray highlighting, it will clear um, kind of unusual text sizes. You want to keep a clean, unformatted approach when you're putting things in Blackboard. It's also not a great idea to use a lot of different color or flashing things in Blackboard to keep things smooth and digitally, digitally accessible for students. It's okay to stick with the Blackboard defaults of solid headings and then just plain text um, throughout. So this is not an area to provide lots of different colors and lots of different options to keep things accessible, keep the formatting clean, keep everything nice and clean. So I've provided this module overview to the students. This is really going to give them that roadmap in addition to that module overview in the folder area when they go into the activities. I'm reiterating again, this is what I'm providing you and this is why. So now I'd like to add a required reading and viewing for them this week as they learn about tempering chocolate. So again, I'm going to build content. I'm going to build a second item. I like to number my items, so I'm going to do uh, my second item that I'm placing in this folder. I'm going to give required reading and viewing crazy chocolate facts. So I'm going to provide, again, even a little bit more context. I'm going to be giving students an article about the chemistry of tempering chocolate and linking to a video. So I've made another statement here that says, this is what I'm providing. What do I want you to do with this information? I'm going to clear out my formatting to make sure it looks nice and clean for students. And then I would like to provide a link to this article from Chemistry World on the science of tempering chocolate. So I can find articles through our library, on the internet, and I can copy these links to articles and paste them inside my Blackboard course. I'm going to show you a great way to provide links that makes them much more accessible and clean for students, and that is providing a descriptive link. So I'm going to share the title of this article. It's called Well-Tempered Chocolate. It's from Chemistry World, 30 November 2015. So some description of where you are linking students out to. Now I copied that link from the website, from the article itself, from Chemistry World. I've typed a description. Now if I highlight that description, I can click on the Insert Edit Link button right here, paste my link path, have this open in a new window for the students, and click Insert. And now I've linked to an outside article for them to read this week, and I've explained why, you know, what I want them, um, why I'm choosing this article. Next, I would like students to watch this video on the science of tempering chocolate to go along with the article. Once they read the article, they can kind of see some of these things in action on this video. When you're choosing videos, it's great to see that the videos are closed captioned if possible. So this video was captioned. So as much as possible, take a look at that as you're searching for videos online. 
a great way to add videos in Blackboard from YouTube is to use this share button. So I'm going to click on share. I'm going to click on embed. One of our share options is embed. And I can copy this funky sort of code here. And Blackboard's going to take this code and make a very nice um, inserted video for the students. So I'm black, back in my Blackboard item. I'm going to switch to a code view, HTML code view, to let me paste that code here. I will paste the code at the very end of anything I see in this box and click Update. I think I got an extra space there. And it'll look like a yellow box at first, but when I click Submit, I can see in my item, let me drag this up, that I now have this link to an article and I have a video that will play right inside Blackboard. It will also let students pop out to YouTube if they wish from here. So linking using descriptive links, sharing videos using embedded video, those are fantastic ways to provide different types of content to the students inside Blackboard. Next, I am going to show you how to attach things in Blackboard and think about a way you could structure actually providing a lecture to your students. So the third thing I'm going to add here, I'm going to build another content item. And I am going to give my students a series of mini lectures that I have made as well as the PowerPoint that goes along with it, a script of the lecture, and a lecture guide for them to look at and answer questions as they go along. So first, as always, I'm going to provide context to the students about why I want them to be going through this lecture, what I want them to get out of it. I'm pasting my text. I'm clearing the formatting. So. I'm going to explain in this week's lecture, we're going to talk about the article and video from above, as well as discuss some more about the tempering process over time. I've broken up the lecture into three mini lectures below, attaching a script for all the lectures for those that wish to follow along or read instead of viewing it. I'm also going to provide a lecture guide, and the lecture guide is going to have questions that students would read and think about and respond to as they're watching. And I'll use that lecture guide as an assignment in our next webinar where students will actually submit the or fill out the questions <coughs> and submit it in an assignment link in Blackboard. So this is showing lots of different ways that you can provide content to students. So in addition to the links to articles, attach videos, a way that you can provide content to students is by attaching files in Blackboard. So I'm going to attach a few files to this item in Blackboard by using this Browse My Computer button. So I am going to first provide an attachment of my PowerPoint that I would have used in class to go through this lecture on tempering chocolate, but I can actually attach that PowerPoint here for the students to look at on their own. I could go into the PowerPoint, into the notes area, and type my lecture into the PowerPoint notes, providing additional context of what I might have shared in the classroom um, <clears throat> if I had been able to show this PowerPoint in real time. And for me, instead of typing the notes into the PowerPoint, I decided to type up a, oh, let me make sure I'm grabbing the right one here. I decided to write a script of my lecture in a Word document. And so I'm going to attach the script of my lecture. And I'll open up that script in a second. Um, but I wrote out what I was going to share with the students. And I'm attaching it here in Word. If possible, it's also nice to provide uh, PDFs as well as Word documents to students so that if students are viewing things on their phones, things like that, providing multiple options for files is always a great idea. So I'm providing a PDF of the lecture script, and I'm also providing it in a Word document format if students find that easier. So I've got my PowerPoint attached. I've attached a script of my lecture and a PDF of my lecture. And then last, I ask students to complete a lecture guide 
uh, as an assignment this week. It's a series of questions that I want them to respond to as they review their um, as they review the videos and the articles and the mini lectures. So I'm attaching it here, and I'm also going to attach it in the assignments area because I want them to submit that to me. And we'll show the assignment part of that in the next webinar. So notice I've been using this browse my computer uh, button and attaching several things to an item this week. So attachments are a great way to get materials to your students in Blackboard. And as always, I've provided right at the start that context for what are these attachments, what would I like you to do with those. So I'm going to start, I'm going to submit this so I can show you what this looks like in Blackboard so far. And notice I'm dragging things around. You can move things around in Blackboard that you create. So now I've got, really it's starting to look like a pretty robust week of content. And I'm actually going to remove these prompts now that I've added my assigned reading and viewing. I've added my instructor interpretation. These were the prompts that came along with the, um, with the folder structure. And you can delete items in Blackboard by clicking on that little gray arrow and deleting content. All right. So I've attached all of these different files, lots of different ways that you can provide content to your students. Students access the content simply by clicking on this. And I'm, I'm clicking on this now to show you what my script looks like. Let me pull it over here so you can see it. So notice I just, oh, <laughs> I forgot I didn't really type anything in this. <laughs> this is the Easter egg for the thing. But my, my point here is you can open the files and then you can simply provide, it doesn't have to be anything that's really extensive but simply provide a basic structure for um, a lecture and, uh, and what students should be getting out of PowerPoints and other things that you're providing. The last thing <clears throat> that I want to show you today, um, as far as the content goes, is I've made some mini lectures using Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that I also want to link for the students right here in this item so that students can see um, can hear me talk through the tempering chocolate process and watch it in three little parts, following the script if they wish, following the PowerPoint, and then answering the questions in that lecture guide. So I'm not going to go into detail on how to make recordings in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, but on that essential skills page, one of those things that we talked about was how do you make recordings in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra if you want to start recording some of your lectures. So that's absolutely something that you can do. And you can use those that essential skills um, training to help you through that. Um, so I have made uh, in my Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is under Course Tools, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. I have made a series of recordings already. I can go into my recordings menu and I can see there are several here. I made a whopping 31 second recording <laughs> to show as a demonstration. Yours will probably be a little bit longer than that. Um, but we do recommend if you're going to record your lectures, try to keep each chunk of a lecture to 15 minutes or less. So that just makes things more digestible for students. It also helps them pinpoint and you pinpoint different pieces of content that you want to get across to the students each week. So I've divided my lecture into these. this recording 42, 41, and 43 are 31, 15, and 19 seconds long. Your may, yours may be more like, I made 15 minutes, then I did an eight minute recording, then I did <laughs> something like that. But when you've made recordings in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, you can go to your recordings menu and actually copy a link to the recording itself. So once I've copied that link, I can go into my folder and I can actually paste that link as a descriptive link for students to go along with any other lecture materials. So I can edit this item again and I'll just add the first one. So I made, oh, not that, mini lecture one. This one, let's say it's 15 minutes even though we really know it was like 19 seconds or whatever. <laughs> what is 
tempered chocolate. So that was part one of my lecture. Now I copied that recording link. I can highlight this and make that description into an active link to that Collaborate recording. And I can click Open a New Window and Submit. So now I have one lecture linked out. And if I click on it, this is what it looks like for students if you're giving them a recorded lecture. And I can see there I am starting to go through my PowerPoint and Collaborate Ultra. And students can watch and listen and then access the PowerPoint and go through all of the um, additional resources to really cover this content overall. Um, so just to review everything that we've shown today, as far as content, we added, oh, let me back up one more time. We added a module overview, which actually we didn't really add. Let me pull in my completed. This is like the baking show where I say, and now in the oven, I have one, <laughs> I have one that's completely done. So let me, oh, actually, I don't even need to pull that over. I can just, I don't need to pull that over. I can use this. I have the model right here. So now coming out of the oven, we have an already completed weekly folder. So here I've described all of the objectives inside the folder. Here is a completed module overview. I list here are the three outcomes again that I described in the folder. This is what we're going to try to accomplish together this week. You will have three activities in the activities folder. And lo and behold, that is what we developed. We developed three activities. So providing students kind of a checklist of this is what you should see and this is what you should be um, going through this week. First, you're going to read an overview. You're going to read an article and watch a video. Then you're going to watch through the mini lectures and complete the lecture guide. Then I provide, again, a checklist of assignments that I want students to do this week. They're going to be posting to a discussion board, completing the lecture guide, and then take a quick quiz. And we'll be going through those assignments on, in Tuesday's webinar about how you can build some of these assignments in Blackboard. So this is a completed module overview, which I didn't show as I was going through. And then inside our fully, beautifully baked module, we've got this context for students explaining, since we can't see them in person, what's going to be happening this week. Then we've provided additional context, links to things that we need. We've provided attachments to resources in Blackboard. And we've attached mini lectures uh, going through the content. So this is just an example of when we picture what a week of fully online content looks like. That first part of the column, what we provide to students, this is an um, idea of what this could look like. This will obviously be different for everyone's course. Some of you may be using publisher material. That's a great resource for providing this content out to students. But we're not talking about super high tech situations. Notice there isn't a required synchronous session. That is certainly something you could also add to these lectures. You may do the lectures synchronously with students that they could optionally join and you can record. I just made mine on my own, made the recordings um, asynchronously and provided them. So you can tweak this to fit maybe what you've been doing with students up to this point or what you think will work for you and students as you go forward throughout this week. Uh, so to re I'd like to revisit this um, before we move on to questions on providing content. Just a reminder, I have been working in this um, learning modules spring 2020 folder structure that we can place into your course just like you see it here and um, you will get now I feel like I'm uh, on the prices right you will receive everything you see here um, you will get a folder for each week for the rest of the semester inside the folder 
you'll get a place that you can edit your overview. You'll get a place to put activities with just some, some prompts to remind you of what we kind of talked about today and a place to put assignments. So you um, can use that form to uh, the request form that I showed you at the beginning of the webinar to request to have this folder placed into one of your spring 2020 uh, courses to modify and use if you wish. It's not required, but you can request it. I would like to show you, we have done something similar, but more extensive for summer 2020. So let me pop out to my Blackboard and show you the summer 2020 online course template. Now this is a full course template. So this isn't something as simple as just plopping in a course structure. Since we know that summer will begin fully online, there's additional recommendations to help students get oriented to the course um, when it begins in an online format. So we provide a full summer of folders including a course orientation folder that has already suggested um, orientation verbiage, what students can do to get settled in Blackboard, introductory assignments, things like that, as well as um, basically that same folder structure for spring 2020 just laid out for every week of a summer course. So if you would like this full course structure copied into a summer shell, and this is a full course structure. So if you already have content in your summer shell, you may not want this full thing placed in there because it removes other content. But um, if you are still starting with an empty summer shell, you may want to ask for the summer template to be copied in. So on our um, rapid online instruction page, again, in that online instruction support form, this is the place down near the bottom where you can ask for the spring template. And the, the default right now is if you were, you're asking for a spring 2020 template to be pasted. But if you specify summer course, your summer course wouldn't just receive um, the, that one little, the one menu item with just the folders. It would actually receive all of these materials. So. We're providing these to help you for spring and for summer, but remember, it's going to be what works best for you, what works best for your students, and we are going to continue, um, continue providing these webinars and support all throughout this time to help you make this transition. Um, so at this time, I'm going to switch to some designated uh, Q&A time. So if people have put questions into the chat, um, you are, um, that I can address now. Um, I'll have Janet read those to me. Hey, Melissa, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you great. Okay, so can you show from the student preview side what it looks like that for them to turn in an assignment? Okay, sure. I'll show that really quickly. And we'll go into that in much more detail on Tuesday's webinar as well. So if you want to learn more, um, you can tune in to then. So student preview, that's fabulous. I'm really glad that um, someone mentioned this because that was something I did not cover in this session, but we cover in our essential skills session. At any point, you can enter student preview for your course by clicking on that little eyeball looking button. And this will take you into what your course looks like for students. Notice all those control tools fall away. And if I click inside my model, which I've developed with um, content and assignments, I did not go much into this or if at all into assignments folder. But for students, they see a link. You can build an assignment item in Blackboard and they see it as a link. And when they click on that link, it tells them how many points the assignment is worth, and it gives them a place to browse their computer and submit a document to you. Um, and then once they submit that, that will pop up in your grade center, and you'll be able to grade it and provide feedback. And that, um, you can see detailed instructions on what that looks like if you don't want to wait until Tuesday, which I don't 
recommend that you have to wait. Um, there is uh, in the essential online skills session, creating and grading assignments, we go through that in detail and we'll be covering that um, in even more detail in Tuesday's webinar. So that's a fantastic question and assignments will be very, um, very important and very useful as we move forward in the online environment. Great question. Okay, thanks, Melissa. So another question. How do you make the long lines to separate between the parts of the module overview? Uh, okay. Oh, good question. Okay. I was like the long, yep. So when you are editing in Blackboard and you would like to make one of those nice um, attractive lines, you can go to where you'd like the line, and there's actually a little line menu item here. So you, most of the time, we don't even notice a lot of these tools that are here. There's just a button, and you can add lines there. So you can do this. It doesn't have to be in a module overview. It can be in any item in Blackboard. You can use these, these line options um, and add those, to your, uh, add those to items in your course. If for some reason you're not seeing some of these tools, sometimes your tool menu might be collapsed, just click on that um, show more and you should see all of the different tool options. Good eye, good question. Okay, you got a big thank you for showing that. Yeah, um, you're welcome. Okay. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, if you want to put them in the chat right now. Okay, we just came in here, so hold on, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, how do students see your comments with grading? So I don't know if you want to cover that right now or, um, you know, because we are going to have a grade book webinar coming up. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you ask that one more time? I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I saw something pop up on my. I'm. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Um, somebody had, somebody's asking about the students seeing how they see their comments when you grade something. Oh, sure. Um, so yes, and and I did hear the end of your comment where you said we'll be doing an entire session on moving around in the grade book, and also on the um, again on the essential skills. There is a, um, in this creating and grading assignments, we actually walk through the whole process of what it looks like for the students on the other side, how they see your comments, how they see their grade, and we'll be walking through that on Tuesday as well. But I'll just show you a quick, um, it won't be a totally complete kind of idea, but when a student submits an assignment to you and you um, want to grade it, you will go into your grade center and the um, we've got these assignments queued up for for Tuesday to go through in more detail but you'll see a space here where you can actually go through grade provide comments on the student side I'm gonna enter my student preview again students don't have a full grade book they have a space called my grades and that just shows them a list of um, what assignments that you have made for them how many points that they're worth and notice I don't have any points yet I don't have any grades once these assignments are graded there will be a large number so this could say 19 out of 20 will be my score and there'll be a little comment bubble here and that will um, be what they can click on to see your um, to see your comments so they'll be interacting in the my grades area you'll be inputting stuff that they can see in your um, fun and fabulous full grade center here. So that, that's a great question. And we're, um, again, essential skills, creating grading assignments, um, you can see that today. And then if you wanna tune in Tuesday, you'll be able to ask any further questions you have uh, as we go through assignments again. Thank you. Hi, Melissa. Um, yeah. Another question. 
is do you know if Harper has any guidelines for how much time students should be spending on online work each week with their course? Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I might call on if um, Phil or, or Mike are in the chat. I want to make sure that I don't give something that's not, um, not exactly sure. right. Yes, sure, thank I'm you. here, Melissa. It's, it's Mike. Uh, it's a great question, Brent. And um, I'm going to give you two answers, one answer for the spring semester and then one answer for uh, going forward when we're not in the middle of a rapid transition during a global crisis. Um, so I'll start with that one. Like in general, for every one hour that you are in the classroom with your students, the standard is two hours of work outside of the classroom. So in an online environment, that's really difficult to do. Um, because those lines between in the classroom and out of the classroom are really don't exist. Um, it's most of the work typically is asynchronous. So for every credit hour your class is uh, worth, there should be three hours of engagement per week. And I think that would be, like for the spring semester, that's all very different. Um, I think we're not so concerned about you know, following those guidelines to, to a T. But in general, for every hour that you're in the class, there's two hours of work outside of the class um, in general. But I would not be worrying about that specifically during the spring semester. I hope that helps. Thank you, Mike. That was what I was looking at. I, 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 was, I wanted to answer, but I'm like, things are kind of strange right now. So thank you for chiming in and um, providing that. Great question. Melissa? Yes. We had a question, um, and I, I think you probably have, know the answer better than I do, about getting an electronic transcript of your audio recording uh, or video recording. Obviously, it's like really great if you can write a whole script first, and then that script is something you can share for um, with students afterwards along with your video. But are there tools out there that will output a transcript, even if it's not necessarily 100% accurate um, of what you're saying so that it can be edited later and shared with students. Yes, um, the, I will share one that I use and it's one we have right at Harper and then I'll also let when I'm done, if Chris is on the call, um, if he wants to chime in and provide any other um, options, but let's see if I have um, what I will use to make transcripts if I want to sort of speak my lecture and get a transcript started I will actually go to office.com and go to our um, online word <laughs> so we all have um, at office.com you have the full suite of office products that you can access online and there is this little button here that says dictate and as I am talking I can talk about my content and it will actually dictate for me. So that can be really helpful if you are sitting down to you know, write a script, it may be helpful for you to talk it out right in office.com, sign in with your Harper email and um, network password, open up an online Word document and just start dictating. So this can be a great way to get a transcript down, whether you decide to provide a video recording or audio recording later, um, even if you decide to only provide the script, that's great. But then you'll have the script, so when you sit down to show it with PowerPoint or show it with other materials, just having that script is a great way to start, not only for you when you sit down to make a full recording, um, but also it can make things uh, provides that universal design option by providing the script as well as the um, as well as the video for students that may wish to read in addition to or instead of listening or watching. So really just using this dictate tool in 
online word works great for me. Um, Chris, or if anyone else wants to chime in on any other options, um, I'd be happy to, um, um, you know, entertain other suggestions as well. Um, I did place a link to webcaptioner.com. Um, it works pretty good too. I mean, you can have it running in the background and it'll keep uh, do the same thing that you were showing right here. Um, <clears throat> The there the only problem with doing it this way is that there is no time encoding, so um, you may have to um, you know it's not going to follow the the interact it's not going to be an interactive transcript, so it wouldn't follow your video. If you're looking for something like that, you really got to put it up to something like YouTube, um, and so that the time encoding and the transcript kind of match up. Great, thank you, Chris. Thanks for providing that link in the chat. Great question. Great question. This would have been something good to demo right from the start. Hey, Chris, another question um, that came up in the chat. If they already have PowerPoints with audio, do they have the option for that? So that might, you might be best to answer that one, too. So the question is, um, if they've placed audio into a PowerPoint, will that yes. get transcribed? Yes. No, it, it will not. Uh, um, it's an audio file that will get attached. I, I guess it depends um, if you've uh, recorded your audio separately from your PowerPoint and you've created, you know, if you've, you've used something like Web Captioner to capture each one of those slides, um, it can be done. It's just, uh, um, but the online PowerPoint does allow for live uh, caption, or I'm sorry, live subtitles. Um, so if you were delivering something like this, uh, collaborate right. session, um, you could be sharing your um, PowerPoint online or uh, Microsoft through Office 365, Microsoft PowerPoint online. You could have your slides up um, and be talking and the, the, the subtitles will show up underneath your uh, presentation. So I just went into to PowerPoint. Report. I went into PowerPoint online, yeah, ahead, Chris. Here, um, are you see you seeing that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So then, um, I just wanted to follow where you were mentioning. Well, uh, if you have another PowerPoint that you could pull up instead of starting with a blank one, you'd be better off. Oh, sure. Off. Okay. Will do. I bet I could find one. I'm sure you could. Yep. Okay. There you go. So now if you go under the view tab. And there, yep, turn on use subtitles. And then the subtitle settings just allows you to put this where either underneath, above. Okay. Nice. And then uh, if you go into presentation mode now and start talking. I'll allow it to use my microphone. Yes. I'll hide this. Want to. All right. So if I was in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and recording this and I activated my subtitles, this would at least give me some basic subtitling while I am going through my PowerPoint. Thank you, Chris. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. The The problem only with this is that it's, you know, the recording, it's going to be burned into the recording. It's closed captioning. Correct. Yep. Okay, I just, uh, just for clarification. All right. 
Any other questions? I, uh, looks like we still have plenty of people on the line. I, I can't imagine that there isn't someone that may still have a question. <laughs> Okay, Chris, I will have a question of probably for you. Oh, okay. um, can we use the PowerPoint subtitles instead of closed captioning? So uh, it's uh, uh, it's definitely a, a like a, an easy uh, or not easy. I'm sorry. It's it's a good practice, right? Um, if if that's all you're doing is uh, um, delivering content through PowerPoint. It's uh, it's a good practice, right? But uh, it's not perfect because if you were sharing other applications or if you were doing other things during your session, obviously um, those subtitles would not come across. It would only work with PowerPoint. Thank you, Chris. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just, no, at, okay. at, oh no, that's fine. Um, and I did want to, to plug, I, maybe that's what Chris is going to say. Our, um, fifth part of the webinar series, um, is all about universal design and they'll, um, be a deeper dive because these are fabulous questions. We'll be talking into different ways to provide alternative methods to provide, um, accessible options like captioning. Um, so we're doing an entire webinar in the series on these topics um, because they are so important and it's really great that we're hearing questions on those. Um, at this point, we're reaching our 1130 time frame. So I just wanted to remind everyone on harperacademy.net um, that that resources and support page is there. That's where you can find the essential online skills. Uh, recordings, that's where you can find the instructional support form. There's also um, um, a big green button, I didn't circle it here, but down to the right where you can click on to uh, get support and request either the spring folders or the summer course shell to help you. Um, oh, that's here, yep, the, <laughs> it's going through that. Just a reminder again that you can get um, 0.2 CEUs for your time and learning today. Um, if you go to harperacademy.net um, and you go to our online instructional webinar series page where you found the links to, to get to this session, there is a form specifically for this session, um, a personal action plan you can complete to reflect on what you learn. And if you submit the required questions in the personal action plan form to us by May 1st, you can receive 0.2 CEUs for your time today. Um, I just, I can't thank everyone enough, all of our um, academy staff that worked to put this webinar uh, series together um, and plan this and all of the faculty, oh my gosh, that are helping our students in so many ways and really stepping up to help each other um, and help everyone get through this get through this time. So just by spending the time with us this morning, that's just amazing. Uh, just trying to learn um, in this very very challenging time. Um, everyone's doing a lot to continue to really model what being a, a lifelong learner and uh, being willing to learn is all about, and also being being a helper. So. Just thank you to everybody. Um, well, we did the Q&A already, but we will, again, we're recording this and we'll be making it available on harperacademy.net. Um, so you'll be able to watch through this again at any time. Any other comments from the Academy group? Otherwise, we will sign off today. I just wanna, this is Mike. I just wanna uh, publicly thank Melissa and everyone in the Academy team uh, who, like the rest of the college, has been, you know, working on transitioning their own work remotely, which is an adjustment for everybody, but then also supporting, um, you know, nearly 700 faculty in that process. So they've just done an incredible job of that. And uh, this is the first of five parts in the webinar series, and we hope that you will join us live or watch recordings as we go forward. So thanks to you all. All right. So with that, have uh, a wonderful day. 
from my window, I can see that the sun is shining. Um, so take some time to stretch and get outdoors. And we will hopefully see you on April 7th for part two, bringing your course activities and assignments <clears throat> online. So thank you, everyone. And um, have a wonderful day. Be well. Stay safe.